Good morning, everyone. I'm Madeline Gustafson, and I'm a project coordinator at the National Environmental Health Association. I'd like to welcome you to the Project First Line Environmental Health Q&A session. We thank you all for joining us today. I'd now like to introduce, you, introduce to you Christine Ortiz Gumina. Christine is a program manager of emergency preparedness, response, and recovery at the National Network of Public Health Institutes. Thank you everyone for joining us. I'm really excited about this opportunity and this partnership with NEHA. And I look forward to the future opportunities that we will create together in order to best serve the environmental health workforce and uh, teach them more about infection prevention and control. So a little bit about NNPHI. Our mission is to support national public health systems initiatives and strengthen public health institutes to promote multi-sector initiatives resulting in measurable improvements. Our vision is to innovate, foster public health institutes across the nations collaborating to improve population health. Next slide, please. This slide is all our uh, member public health institutes. We serve over 40 members. They are nonprofit organizations that improve the public health by fostering innovation. Our NNPHI team is connected to over 40 members in 30 states, DC, Puerto Rico, and these institutes implement initiatives in all 50 states. We are also working with Seven Directions, an indigenous public health institute. Next slide, please. Project First Line is a CDC-led collaborative of academic, public health, and healthcare partners in 64 state, local, and territorial health departments funded through a cooperative agreement to develop interactive and empowering infection control training. Project First Line is a national collaborative for infection prevention and control and is committed to preparing frontline healthcare workers and the public health workforce to protect themselves and their communities from infectious disease threats. The key components of Project First Line are core training to address immediate workforce infection control needs, practice tools to support those implementing infection control protocols, partner engagement, internship, public health technical capacity building to leverage public health workforce to facilitate knowledge and tool sharing between public health departments and their local clinical communities, and innovation to deepen the knowledge to better inform infection control recommendations. So with that, I would like to now introduce Gina Barr, the Associate Director of Program and Partnership Development for the National Environmental Health Association. She has been a registered nurse for 25 years and is also an environmental health specialist. She has a strong background in infection control, food safety, and emergency preparedness. Thank you, Christine. And thanks everyone so much for spending some time with us today talking about infection prevention and control. I know how busy you all are, so your time is very much appreciated. NEHA is proud to serve as the leading environmental health organization that brings together agencies, other organizations, and practitioners from around the world and connects them to cutting edge tools, informative resources, and to each other. NEHA is committed to advancing the environmental health profession by providing an inclusive environment that promotes personal growth and professional development. NMPHI and NEHA are working together with the CDC to connect environmental health professionals with infection prevention and control resources. Today's Q&A session is just the beginning. We will also be developing fact sheets, toolkits, infection prevention trainings, and Project First Line four-part ECHO series that's going to be aimed at environmental health professionals. As you know, environmental health professionals are essential contributors to the delivery of public health services by anticipating, assessing, and reducing risks associated with modern life. These services include infection control and disease prevention, among many others. In the spring of 2020, and again later that summer, NEHA conducted a nationwide environmental health workforce needs assessment in response to COVID-19. We had a large variety of responses from all across the nation, and as you all can well attest, the majority of 
respondents are actively involved in the COVID-19 response. There were also a couple of infection prevention gaps that were identified in that survey, including guidance on cleaning and disinfection, as well as the use and limitation of personal protective equipment. So now I would like to introduce you to Dr. Timothy Landers. Dr. Landers is a nurse and epidemiologist whose work centers around infection prevention and control. Tim works as a nurse scientist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Good afternoon, Dr. Landers. It's nice to have you with us today. Great, great to be. I'm looking forward to this, Gina. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Are you ready for our first question? I think that I am. Fantastic. So the first question is, what exactly does infection prevention and control mean? And why does it matter to environmental health professionals? Well, thanks, Gina. Um, that is a great question. Um, in, in healthcare settings, we often talk about infection prevention, which is the set of policies and procedures and guidelines that are developed to prevent the transmission of disease-causing pathogens um, in, in that setting. Infection prevention and control um, means to control the source of infection. And the, the terms are used somewhat interchangeably depending on the organization and the setting in the country or the region. Um, what Project First Line is looking at doing is improving baseline knowledge of infection prevention and control or infection prevention. And it uh, is very important to environmental health. We have seen over the past year that the community has been a primary um, site of transmission of uh, COVID-19. And so environmental health plays a key role the health of the environment and the sanitation practices that we uh, are all monitoring and um, practicing are critically important to prevent the transmission of uh, COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Landers. As you know, one of the main jobs of environmental health specialists is to prevent outbreaks mm. and when they do happen. So even though infection prevention has really been more of a health care term, it's really something that we've been doing all along. Absolutely, that is true. All right, let's get to our next question. I hear the terms SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 a lot. What are the difference between the terms? Great, so um, SARS-CoV-2 is, is the name, the scientific name of the organism that causes COVID-19. Um, believe it or not, there is a uh, scientific committee that is in charge of naming all of the coronaviruses that we know about. And we have known about coronaviruses in people and animals um, for quite some time. This happens to be a, a, a beta coronavirus. And if we ever um, get to corner the people on that committee to ask why they said SARS-CoV-2. I think what they'll say is that it's related to previous generations of um, that type of coronavirus. When we think about COVID-19, that's the clinical disease that people develop when SARS-CoV-2, the virus, which is the agent uh, responsible for the development of disease, infects a person, infects a susceptible host, and they develop the symptoms that we're familiar with, fevers and, and myalgia and cough and respiratory illnesses and, and a range of illnesses from not having any, any symptoms at all, um, but being infected and being able to transmit it, being asymptomatic to very severe disease where people need you know, ventilator support and, and heart and lung bypass. So SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus that causes COVID-19. Thank you, that explanation is so helpful. So one is the name of the virus, the other is the disease that it causes, kind of like varicella zoster is the chickenpox. Exactly, yeah, so we have, um, you know, many types, there are many subtypes of, of the herpes simplex virus that can go on to cause cold sores and general herpes and chicken pox. And within that, the varicella zoster, zoster virus can cause clinical illness in a susceptible host. You're exactly right. Perfect. Question number three, Dr. Landers. What are the main ways COVID-19 spreads? 
another great question, one that we're learning more about um, kind of uh, as this pandemic has evolved, we believe that the primary way that co that SARS-CoV-2 or coronavirus spreads is through large respiratory droplets. And so these are um, things that we expel in normal conversation, but especially when we cough or sneeze or laugh or, or talk, right, um, that these um, larger sized droplets are expelled into the air. And we're, we're learning about kind of the particle size and, and some of the technicalities, but um, we believe that that's the main uh, way that it's transmitted. So that has implications for things like wearing a mask and, and social distancing, which I hope we'll, we'll get to later. But there, there have been some case reports that you know, many people may have seen that it's able to stay in the air or to um, be transmitted through an airborne route through smaller particles. Um, and we don't believe that that's the primary route of transmission. We believe it is those respiratory droplets. But there have been some studies mapping out where people are sitting in a restaurant or in a bus where you wouldn't expect them to have exposure to droplets, but they might to an airborne pathogen. So um, the, the primary way, again, is through respiratory droplets. There is also the potential that a respiratory droplet could land on an inanimate object you know, a desk or a phone or a door handle. And then someone who's susceptible could contact that primarily with their hands. And then as they just go about their day, uh, you know, they touch their eyes or they touch their nose and they introduce the virus into their body and uh, they become infected that way. But again, the, the primary route is through, uh, we believe is through respiratory droplets and there may be the potential for other routes of transmission as well. And that's why you see these kind of recommendations that are evolving as we learn more about outbreaks and, and the settings in which they're occurring. Well, that the last part of your response there kind of leads, leads us right into our next question, which is, can SARS-CoV-2 live on surfaces for very long? And are there particular surfaces in restaurants, daycares, and other buildings that should be a higher priority for cleaning and disinfection? Another great question. And you know, the um, the thinking on this and, and the public health recommendations have evolved somewhat. Um, what we know, um, just to talk about coronaviruses first, is um, they are enveloped viruses, so they're somewhat fragile, and we would not expect them to persist on environmental surfaces beyond hours to days, perhaps. Um, now, of course, there's a host of other pathogens, right, that we have to be concerned about, some of which can live for weeks to months on inanimate surfaces. But when we're specifically um, talking about the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there is the potential um, that surfaces could become contaminated. They wouldn't get infected, but they get contaminated. And when a susceptible host comes along, contacts that and again, either touches their own mucous membranes or someone else's that they could infect either themselves um, or someone else. So how we have looked at classifying that is to start out with what we call high touch surfaces. So those are things that you routinely would contact when you enter a restaurant, when you go into um, you know, a retail setting. Things like um, door handles, right? push buttons, elevator buttons. Um, there have been studies looking at contamination of elevator buttons in the hospital, and you want to just be really careful. Let me just say that, um, you know, that in the environment, these, um, especially the longer pers persisting pathogens, um, have, have been detected for, for weeks. What, um, so when we're thinking about a setting like a restaurant or a food service establishment, any high touch surface, so things like a point of sale terminal or cash register, right? If menus are passed back and forth, especially if people are kind of, you know, taking a drink and looking at their menu with their mask, you know, taking their mask off, looking at their menu, giving it back to a server and then passing it to someone else. Um, that's the type of contact exposure that we would be most concerned about. So telephones, 
um, pens that people you know would use and then pass to someone else to use, any high touch surface. And we get especially concerned about um, restrooms. So bathroom handles, um, sink faucets. Um, we can talk later about air dryers and paper towel dispensers. You know, those are things that people are contacting um, as they're washing their hands. So any of those high touch surfaces um, are areas where we should focus. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, in the environmental health field, we use that term high touch surfaces um, a lot, especially when we're dealing with an outbreak like norovirus. So this all probably sounds um, pretty similar to our audience, pretty familiar, um, but it's those exact same surfaces that we're looking at. So since you brought up norovirus, it's a good chance just to remind all of us that what we're talking about uh, while we're focusing on um, COVID-19 and preventing the transmission um, of COVID-19, that really these strategies have a lot of downstream effects, right? Neurovirus and C. diff and MRSA and VRE and all of the pathogens that we believe now are circulating in the community, um, or what we know to be circulating in the community, um, like all of these are good practices for preventing all, you know, um, a wide range of, of pathogen transmission. That's a really great reminder. Let's move to our next question. What does the term standard precautions mean and how would that apply to me as an inspector working in the field? So that actually has a technical definition on the healthcare side. Infection, um, when, when we talk about standard, standard precautions, um, um, Gina, we did, a, we did a study looking at the terms that nurses used, used to describe um, standard precautions and it, you know, it evolved from this idea of universal precautions and body substance isolation and blood, you know, body fluid isolation, all this stuff. Um, but we, we started to streamline it to talk about a core set of infection prevention and control measures um, that we do all the time, regardless of whether we know if someone is uh, infected or not. So the first part of standard precautions uh, is hand hygiene cleaning or, or washing your hands. And in healthcare settings, we rely either on alcohol-based hand rubs in most situations or in hand washing using good technique, but that's one component um, of what we consider uh, standard precautions. The second um, component of standard precautions are, is cleaning and disinfection, that there's some schedule to try to control pathogens in the environment um, and is focusing on those high touch surfaces, using approved agents, using the correct uh, contact time. So that's another part of um, what we consider standard precautions. A third part is our, the use of barrier precautions. And that is that we treat um, every um, opportunity where we could be exposed to blood or body fluids as a potential risk of infection. So we're using gowns and, and gloves and masks and goggles and bonnets and um, all kinds of things to try to um, prevent us acquiring that infection and to keep our patients safe. So the use of what we call barrier precautions or the use of personal protective equipment or PPE um, is another uh, foundation of standard precautions. I do wanna mention um, that in healthcare, uh, another key component of standard precautions are safe injection practices, because we know a lot of the healthcare associated um, or nosocomial acquired infections among healthcare workers can occur through a needle stick or a sharps injury. So there are all these um, components of a safe injection practice um, program that are recommended um, every time, every patient. So um, in safe injection practices is another part of what we call um, standard precautions. And then um, lastly is what we've all been learning more about, and that's good um, cough etiquette, good respiratory hygiene, uh, coughing into our sleeve using a tissue and hand hygiene right after that, um, stepping away or turning your head if, if you're going to cough or sneeze, like all of those things. Um, are part of what we consider standard precautions. And um, nowadays, um, 
the standard precautions have just been a routine part of our workflow that we implement these on every patient every time. And if I can have a proud dad moment, I was uh, in the kitchen um, last year and, and my son was at the sink and he was washing his hands and I got a little teary eyed because I was watching him and I said, Brian, your hand washing technique is excellent. And he said, well, dad, that's what you taught me. Right. And I was like, oh, like all that pays off. So we do it every time, whether we think we need it or not, whether we know the uh, patient's infectious or not. So that's what we mean by standard precautions. And I, I realize that in, in the setting of environmental health, that not all of those components apply. Certainly many of them do. Um, but that's what we mean when we talk technically about standard precautions. Well, that, that's great. You brought up a, a couple of points there. One, we should all be washing our hands because we never know when there's going to be a little one washing us. And, and so we should be modeling the way um, for everyone. Um, and then also, you know, environmental health has really been called into so many um, different areas to respond to this, including um, vaccine distribution and pods and things like that. So I'm really glad that you brought up the safe injection practices because it is something that we are um, having to think about in environmental health as we set up um, these different drive-through vaccine clinics and things like that. So those are excellent points. And to summarize some of the other things that our audience should be thinking about are just the general hand washing, face coverings, and social distancing. So we, you know, we would lump all of those things that you just mentioned, which are still important and are going to be important for controlling the pandemic for the foreseeable future, into cough and respiratory hygiene, right? And hand and um, hand hygiene. And then I, I just want to go back to something that you said, Gina, which is right on. And that is that um, when we as public health professionals, healthcare workers, when we're out and about in the community, you can bet that people are watching what we are doing. We need to set the example. And so you kind of taking our time to use good technique, especially for hand hygiene, practicing really good um, um, cough, respiratory etiquette, all of that, because we're setting the example and people are going to learn from what we do, what we say to do, what we do, and what we don't do. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, let's get to question number six. What is the difference between cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization? All right. So again, we have technical definitions and in infection prevention and control for cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. And, and we're talking about three uh, different processes, right? So first is cleaning is the removal of foreign material on the surface that you're cleaning. So if your, your hands are dirty, um, washing them removes that dirt and grime because we know that quote unquote dirt and grime is not just like, um, is not only inert substances, right? It will have skin cells or plenty of bacteria and viruses. Um, and cleaning is just the, the mechanical or the chemical scrubbing and removing of that foreign substance. And cleaning is the first step in disinfecting and sterilization. You could, because you can't disinfect properly uh, without cleaning. And part of that is um, what we are learning about biofilms, which you can think of a surface, something like a mop bucket, which um, has a forest, a microscopic forest of microorganisms that have become used to people trying to wash them down the drain. And so it becomes thick, it becomes gooey. And if you try to disinfect it, many agents are not able to penetrate that biofilm, which is everywhere. Right, we just live in an environment that just is has has ten times more bacteria than humans, so we're outnumbered anyway. But um, when we talk about disinfection, this is a process. I think um, most people will be more familiar with the term of sanitizing, where we're reducing the number of disease-causing pathogens, um, bacteria, or viruses, and, and there are a few others. 
um, to levels that are not likely to cause disease. So the, the testing criteria is you know, that 99.9% .9 threshold, reducing the number of disease causing pathogens. Um, and there are disinfecting agents that also have surfactants that kind of lift out that um, that biofilm and can also disinfect at the same time, but they really are, um, are separate processes. Um, and then lastly, you mentioned sterilization, which is um, the elimination of all microbial life um, on an object or on a surface. As human beings, we can never be sterile, right? But we can take um, scissors or something like a pen even and completely sterilize it. It will reacquire um, pathogens fairly quickly, but sterilization means the elimination of all microbial life so that that object um, cannot transmit infection. So we talk about three different things. They are often, you know, kind of inappropriately used, and there are some terms that are out there. Um, and then if I could just talk about disinfection for a minute, um, we talked about um, chemical agents that do disinfect. And a couple of points there, we wanna make sure that we're using uh, the right product, right? Um, and there is, I think we're gonna put in chat, the EPA registered products that are, are effective against coronavirus, against COVID-19. And also all the manufacturers have these instructions for use about things like how it's to be diluted or reconstituted, how, it's, um, how long the contact time needs to be, um, and if I can just digress for a second, I have another story about taking a group of first semester nursing students through the hospital and they were you know, working with their patients for the first time. And we were walking by um, the janitor who had his mop in the bucket. And one of the students knew him, you know, kind of made a smart aleck remark. And I was like, what, what did you say to our environmental services professional, <laughs> right? So I said, come on, come. So we went back and I said, hey, Robert, I, what are you doing? He's, are you holding the mop up? And he said, uh, no, Tim, um, this agent has a three minute contact time. So I was timing myself. I was timing the agent on the floor to make sure it was effective. Wow. And I turned to the student and I said, ha, whose job is more important here? Your, his or ours, right? Um, but it just reminded me like all of these uh, minutia or things like the instructions for use are really important um, and to follow those, especially for something like cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. Yeah, that's such a good point. I know some of them too, the, the water temperature um, matters. So there's really a lot to pay um, attention to there. And how long they can be kept at room temperature after they're reconstituted, right? What is the right dilution, um, you know, um, for, for the volume that you're mixing. Yeah. And so I sometimes scare people by saying, you know, it's a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner other than which it's labeled, right? So we have to make sure that we're following the instructions and using the right agent. Wonderful. All right. Our next question, um, and I know this one comes up a lot, is hand sanitizer just as effective as hand washing? I have to take a deep breath on this one because <laughs> it's something that I feel very passionately about. And I think uh, buried in that question, which I think was pre-submitted, so thank you because it's a thoughtful question. Um, there really are two things I think that you're asking. Um, one is efficaciousness and one is effectiveness. In healthcare, we talk about hand hygiene, and that means the use of an alcohol-based hand rub or hand washing with soap and water using good technique for both of those products. What, um, what we know about the healthcare setting is people are busy, right, and going from place to place, and that hand washing, if it's done properly, right, would take 50 to 90 seconds, somewhere in that range. And so when alcohol-based hand rubs containing 62% or more of ethyl alcohol uh, came out, we realized that people would use them more often because we can kind of trick them by putting things that soften the skin. We can control the dry time based on how much water is in the formulation um, and things like foam, right? So all of which... Um, make it more palatable for people to be able to do. And so 
uh, the original studies on hand hygiene were done with chlorinated lye. And it worked, believe it or not, to get rid of um, diseases on the hands of healthcare workers. The problem was that your hands cracked and bled if you were using this several times a day. So of course now we have um, better products that are out there and there, there's a range of antibacterial, non-antibacterial soaps and um, a, a whole range of, of hand sanitizers. They are both efficacious, that is for sure. Um, in, in most settings. I'll talk about a couple of exceptions here in a minute. But we, we believe that the use of alcohol-based hand rubs in is more effective because people will do it, right? And I, I recognize that in food service facilities and in other settings that we don't recommend the use of alcohol-based hand rubs. Um, we recommend hand washing with soap and water, again, uh, with good technique. And you can get, um, you know, the posters um, not only to remind you, remind users how to perform hand hygiene, but also to prompt them um, to do it, right? Kind of in the in on the way in, way out of the restroom, or or whenever is important. Um, so again, we talk about these two things around hand hygiene. And I, I do know that in other settings, in food service in particular, that the use of alcohol-based hand rub does not substitute for hand washing. But if you're in a non-food preparation role, alcohol-based hand rubs are effect, just as effective as hand washing. Now, they don't work against all organisms. Many people have heard of um, C. diff, right, which is a, a nasty bug that um, that forms spores and that persists for weeks on environmental surfaces uh, and is spread through the fecal oral route. In the setting of C. diff, either known or suspected, or things like norovirus, we recommend hand washing with soap and water. And again, those food, pr food preparation areas following the usual protocol. Um, you know, what was interesting is if you think about ruining a vacation, um, the cruise lines were actually really concerned about norovirus outbreaks because, you know, a, a norovirus GI, out, GI outbreak will, will, will ruin your fun for sure, right? <laughs> um, and so there have been developments on alcohol-based hand rubs that are effective against norovirus, but those aren't widely deployed. They're not as well tolerated as um, as uh, other products. So we recommend hand washing in those settings. Uh, and we're moving now to even in a pre-surgical scrub to recommend um, hand washing um, when the hands are visibly soiled and then the use of alcohol-based hand rub after that, right? Because you kind of get an additive effect. It's easier to use and the coverage is better. The other thing um, to point out is that technique is really important for the use of, for performing hand hygiene, whether it's the use of hand rub or uh, hand washing. And I think uh, if folks are out and about in the community, that's one thing that would be really good to be explicit about. Um, you know, sometimes you see people do crazy things like trying to wave their hands. That accelerates the dry, dry time. It decreases the uh, efficacy of the product. But really, to make sure that you're getting all the surfaces of the thumbs, the fingertips, both sides of the hands, the most common area, areas that are missed are in, in the cuticles and the fingertips, which also happen to be areas where we can contaminate or get contaminated fairly easily. So, um, but that's a very long answer to your question is, is it just as effective? And the answer is in most settings, it absolutely is uh, with those exceptions that we talked about. So I, I want to probe that a little bit more because you brought up a point earlier about the, the faucets um, possibly being contaminated, the knobs as their high touch surfaces. So you did a great job describing um, the surfaces of your hands to wash, but when I'm done washing my hands, um, should I grab a paper towel and turn off those handles? Like how is the best way to handle that if, no pun intended there, but how is the best way to handle that if the, the handles on the faucet are high touch surfaces? That's a great question. Um, um... And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a couple different settings, right? At, at home, you're cleaning, disinfecting, and your family's there anyway, which you're probably hugging. So, you know, like that's that's a different setting. 
but if you're in a public place, we do know that moist or wet surfaces transmit virus and bacteria more effectively than dry surfaces. And I'm sure I'm never gonna be invited to a party at your house, Gina, but I was at a party and uh, was washing my hands. And then I looked around and I took the towel and I used it because it wasn't my home um, to turn off the faucet. In a public place like a restaurant or a retail establishment, for sure, you know, you're talking about lots of people coming in and out with um, kind of unknown hygiene, right? So yeah, that, and that's kind of what I meant about, um, about good technique, right? Is not contacting the wet surface um, of the sink when you're done drying it and exiting with a towel or no touch door. But the other cool thing that I think is kind of developing and, and we'll see more and more are touchless faucets and, and touchless soap dispensers, which you know I, I think are great um, because we know that those are, are, are high touch surfaces and that you have high traffic in those areas with a, a large potential for disease transmission. So what do I do? What would I recommend for sure? If you're out in a public place, you know, turn off that faucet um, with a paper towel. Excellent. And I know not all settings have paper towels. Sometimes we have the, the air dryers instead. So maybe this is a great um, time that if I do have that, hand sanitizer out in my car when I get into my car after I'm done with my inspection or visit to a facility, I can just do a little hand sanitizer once I get in my car. Okay, yes. Except you got me a little bit nervous when you said do a little, right? Because um, <laughs> right, right. The, you know, these dispensers, right? They're all carefully calibrated to dispense 2.2 to 3.8 or so milliliters of product. And sometimes we half touch, right? Or do kind of little cheats, right? Because it dries faster and we're still doing it, right? Um, but yeah, um, and, and something like a two ounce um, bottle for personal carriage, right? That really shouldn't be, depending on how busy you are, right? It shouldn't be more than 10 or 15 applications really. So, sorry to call you out on that, but I, I get a little nervous because I want to be technically precise. Yeah, no, that's a really, um, really great point for sure. Just make sure that we have enough on there um, to cover all the surfaces um, on our hands thoroughly. So that's a really good point. All right, question number eight. I'm required to wear a mask when I'm out doing inspections. Can I wear the same mask from inspection to inspection? That is a great question. And one that we're learning about. We faced some challenges here over the past year in terms of availability of PPE. And, but we've also learned more about, about transmission. And we um, have been working on a list of things that we thought as infection preventionists that we thought we never would be saying. And one of the things is that it's okay to reuse a mask. But with the shortages um, that we have, wearing a mask, right, prevents those droplets from going out into the environment, right, and potentially infecting someone else. And as public health workers, it's a really good example, right, for us to be setting, um, to be wearing a mask. So yes, it is really important as a, as a means of source control um, or kind of spewing it out. There may be some protection ab about breathing it in, um, but for sure it's important. So um, it, it, as long as you are using good technique in taking the mask on and off, kind of avoiding contaminating your hands or your eyes or your, right, with, uh, as you're taking the mask off, trying to avoid um, contacting those surfaces. Because again, what we're trying to do is trying to prevent the spread of those droplets um, when, when someone's either asymptomatic or, or pre-symptomatic, pre meaning that they're infected, but they just don't know it, right? Um, that um, we should be doing that all the time. Now, if a mask gets soiled, if it gets wet, if it's difficult to breathe through, that mask should be discarded and you should use a new one or you know, kind of wash the one that you have at home. And, and we believe that household laundering would be effective at uh, reducing or killing um, most pathogens on e either fabric. Certainly, um, you know, the, the paper ones 
you should be uh, throwing away. And, and what is recommended now in the community are, are uh, masks, paper masks, surgical masks, or a cloth mask. We don't really have to be as concerned about an N95 mask, which has um, kind of a different purpose and they're diff more difficult to breathe through. So I think it would be okay um, uh, to, to reuse it as long as you're using good technique. And again, we'll put the link, I think on your left here, right in the chat box for how to take on and put off for what we call donning and doffing um, of PPE. Okay. Yes, we will make sure that we um, get that in the chat. And I know that Maddie was going to put um, some different links in there. I know we also got some questions. Obviously, we, we can't go through them all today, but we got some um, specific questions about um, certain settings like um, correctional institutions and nursing homes. And I think there were some school questions so Maddie has um, resources from the CDC from all of those different settings. So she's gonna drop those in the chat as well. Okay. All right. So our next question is, when I meet people to conduct inspections, what are some general precautions I should be taking? Yeah, that is a great question. I love it. That is what we need to be doing, right? Uh, um, as environmental health workers. So I think, um, there are a couple of core recommendations. The first, of course, is to continue mask wearing. Um, that's going to be important for the foreseeable future, even as vaccine uptake increases. Still recommended when you're out and about in public. Other people, you don't know their vaccination status. And so routine mask wearing uh, would be recommended. I think that's one really important um, uh, step that people should be taken, taking. Secondly, trying to maintain social distance as much as possible when you're out and about, maintaining that kind of six foot distance um, while still being able to do your work. You don't have to be you know, overly concerned about jumping into somebody's bubble, right? But as much as possible, especially if you're having a long conversation, um, perhaps someone's cracking a joke, right? And, and um, these droplets are spewed, that that continues to be important as much as it's feasible. Um, I think another recommendation, um, and CDC does have guidelines for, for restaurants and bars um, to limit the use of shared items as much as possible. So things like um, the folios that your bill comes in or a menu or a pen, uh, if you're the inspector or something like a clipboard, right? You wanna limit sharing of those items um, as much as possible. Um, lastly, um, for protecting yourself, I would encourage uh, all of our attendees today to get vaccinated at the first opportunity that you have in accordance with your public health agency's recommendations for distribution of the vaccine. And they vary by state, sometimes by locality, but I would follow those guidelines. And when it's your turn, I would really encourage you um, to get vaccinated as a way to protect you and to help keep um, our community safe. Um, so what do we have so far? We have uh, mask wearing, social distancing, limiting, um, uh, limiting the use of shared items, getting vaccinated, um, and then continuing to focus on hand hygiene, hand washing, um, and use of alcohol-based hand rubs if hand washing is not available. That's another really important step. Um, and I'm going to go off script here and say that this has been a very stressful time. Um, for people in public health, I know uh, we've been asked, you mentioned correctional institutions and schools and bars and restaurants and shopping facilities and daycares, like all kinds of places that we knew were out there. Um, and it's really important at this time to, folk, to keep ourselves he as healthy as we can, right? Practicing good self-care and uh, you know, doing those things to, to make sure that we are well taken care of. And certainly, you know, if we're having symptoms, if we're not feeling well, if we have a fever, or we have a cough, um, to let, let our supervisors and our colleagues know, because that's, it's not a time for you to be going out in the community if you're not sure, um, if you have some weird symptoms, and, and to seek, seek care promptly to prevent transmission. 
I think that's those would be the starting points. You know, there are all these things that you kind of have to tailor based on the setting, but those would be the main things that I, I think would be important. Yeah, that's that's really good. And a couple of points there that you made me um, think about. One, you know, I know our audience um, and I know that they are so dedicated and they just want to be in there and they want to be helping. And I know sometimes there's a little bit of guilt um, about calling in and not wanting to let their team down because everybody has been working so hard. But this is definitely the time um, to take care of yourself. And by calling off of work, you're taking care of your team too um, because we don't want people getting sick. We don't want the community um, getting sick. And then the second point, um, I'm so glad you brought up the, the self-care and and taking care of yourself, uh, both mentally and physically, because we did see that in the needs assessments that we did that I brought up earlier. Um, environmental health and public health are just taking on so much. And we've been at this over a year now, and it's been so stressful. And I know early on when this first started, you know, we were working 70, 80 hours a week. And so I think it's better now, but it's just been sustained for so long um, that it's really taxing on everyone. You know, healthcare is in, in the same boat there. So you really have to take care of yourself or else you can't take care of the community. And I know that's why we are all doing what we do is, is to take care of the community. So I'm really, really glad that you brought that up. Thanks. Um, so just one thing I would say, you know, last May or June was it when we kind of, we had the first wave and things looked like they were settling down a bit. I remember talking to some colleagues about, you know, the beginning of the end. And I said, you know, no, like back then last summer was the end of the beginning. Right. But I, I think we are now starting to see the beginning of the end. So, so there is hope. And, um, you know, if, anything good, right, is coming out of this pandemic. I think the increased emphasis and awareness of the important of pub, importance of public health and environmental health has really, you know, gone up tremendously. So, um, you know, we, we can take uh, some solace in that, I think. So, and then, you know, we've coined a new term. We've known about this, but we always used to be worried about absenteeism, right? What's your absenteeism rate? And and the new term is presenteeism. People who come into work when they really shouldn't, right? And not just in a pandemic, but really, if you if you have a fever, you probably should not be going to work because you probably have some right infectious process that's that's incubating and but as you mentioned in healthcare in the community certainly in public health right we're in the fight now and we don't want to let our colleagues down and people are counting on us but we also have to think about what that means um, if we if we go into work ill right and um, you know for many disease, many viral diseases people are most contagious right before they have the onset of symptoms. And so if you're having symptoms, it's really important to kind of take yourself out. And I think, you know, in, in public health, right, we have a chance to give ourselves some slack and set an example, right? And just say, you know what, I'm not feeling well. I don't think I should be coming in today, right? That, and that should be the end of it. So I remember pulling a weekend shift at a nursing home and I had bad diarrhea. And the nursing supervisor said, oh, you should just come in anyway. We've all got it. And now, like, we would never say that, right? Definitely not, no. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think we have one more pre-submitted question. So let's take a look at that. Um, you know, we just talked about all of the different areas that environmental health is in, the daycares, restaurants. Um, I know that we've been pulled into other places too, which I would not really expect like fraternities and sororities, um, trying to help them develop infection control um, plans. And we discussed that many are running point on vaccine um, clinics and added to the variety of settings that they're working in, the information, as you mentioned, you know, it's kind of evolved as we've gone through this and that can be really overwhelming. So where is the best place our audience can find the most up-to-date information on infection prevention and other COVID-19 related resources? 
Yeah, great question. And, and I think, um, you know, some of the recommendations, especially early on, were changing almost hour by hour as we learned things and kind of went through the recommendation process. So it is important to have a vetted source, right? And um, CDC's Project First Line has a whole suite of tools and resources um, that are updated um, weekly or daily. Um, and so I think that would be a great place to start. I think um, NEHA and NNPHI are doing a great job of trying to get the word out there and kind of going through and identifying the best sources of information that we know as of 150 on March 30th, 2021, right? And, and pushing them out um, through a variety of, of means. Um, so I, and I think, so I would start kind of with CDC project first line and professional organizations like NEHA, like NNPHI, certainly uh, some of the industry groups or the trade groups have developed cutting edge uh, guidelines and recommendations. Um, they can be a little bit slower to change. And then my experience has been that state and local, local health departments have been really on top of things and trying to stay current on the recommendations. Um, and I like to talk about it that way. Like what we know as of right now is that we should be doing this, right? And it's probably not gonna be that way next month. It's certainly, hopefully not gonna be that way in the summer, right? But what we know based on this information as of today is this. And people count on us for that information, right? So having good sources of information um, that are current. Um, whether it, I had not thought until you mentioned it uh, about the um, importance of a fraternity house. I can imagine infection prevention and control would be a nightmare in a fraternity house, but- um, LMG, yes. Yes, G having, you know, a son who's college age now, wow. Um, but libraries, right, and shopping facilities and all kinds of things which are, are new and different environments for us. And we're not familiar with the workflow or people's roles or what types of activities people are doing. I don't think we wanna know what activities people are doing in a fraternity house, but schools and universities and all these things, right? Um, and it, it, is, it is a stressful time, you know, with, with the evolving recommendations and trying to stay on top of it and then figuring out how to uh, implement those, right, in a, um, in a way that makes sense for um, our, the people we're consulting with and also that follow the best guidance, right? It's also like a really cool time. I think we're gonna look back and say, wow, remember when we were asked to um, give recommendations for a homeless shelter or a library or this, this restaurant, you know, that had karaoke night or used to have karaoke night. Um, and, and like we learned a lot of things during this pandemic. What, what helps me to not go crazy is to remember that in the midst of it all, we have foundational knowledge in infection prevention and control. Those things that we've been talking about in infection prevention and in public health for a long time, right? That are, are critically important. And now people are kind of seeing how important it actually is. Um, and going back to that foundational knowledge right, um, can be really helpful. For me, it's very settling to know we can't do things the way we've always done them, right? But a lot of the things that we, that we know that we've been trained and learned about, we can apply in this unusual time and in lots of unusual situations. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. You know, you brought up the CDC's Project First Line um, website. And what I love about that website are there a lot of little short videos that somebody can watch um, if they just have a couple of minutes over lunch or they just get a couple of minutes to sit down, um, they can watch those videos and they're really aimed um, for anyone. They're to meet anybody with any education um, to give them some of that foundational knowledge that you were talking about. So that is a really great um, starting point for our audience and, um, anyone really, it's such a great website. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, if you want a little bit more, um, uh, there are groups that 
and NPHI is one of them. We're now looking at over a thousand uh, COVID-19 trainings. And uh, I'm going to ask Ajay to put in the in the chat the link to the community of practice, where every week um, experts go through and they curate kind of the best resources on a particular topic, or or what we think are are the best resources, and kind of put those out there so you don't get stuck in going down the Google rabbit hole. You know, but these these are trusted, high quality trainings and information, which is the whole goal of Project First Line, right? Is to get high quality information out there um, to the people who need it. Wonderful. Um, I know we're supposed to go to the live Q and A session now, and it looks like Maddie is back on and joined us. I turns out Dr. Landers and I are very chatty when we're together but maybe you can tee up a question for us before, um, before we go. Absolutely. So um, we have a question. I know I have some resources that I will drop in the chat, but just want to open it if either of you have anything to add about any specific best practice recommendations for correctional settings or other congregate settings like schools, homeless shelters, etc. So, you know, there is a saying that all, um, all infection prevention is local. And uh, I cut my teeth as a nurse in a homeless shelter. So I'm familiar with that setting in particular. I'm not as familiar with correctional settings, but I know that there are some, uh, there are some guidance and guidelines that are out there. And I think Maddie, you're gonna put some of that in chat. But to think about those core infection prevention and control principles and know the workflow and um, the requirements of that setting, is really important. And it's actually what makes our work so interesting is that we take these core principles and look at a setting and see how we ad adopt them. Great. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. So we have an attendee that specifically responds to suspected norovirus incidences. Um, are there any best practices for norovirus investigation in terms of infection control and preventing inspector infection? Well, um, assuming that you are like a dedicated norovirus case investigator, I think I should be asking you what the best practices are. Um, because yeah, I mean, so hats off to you if you if that's what you're doing. And I don't know how often you get sick or if you've gotten sick, but whatever you're doing, keep doing it. Um, we know for norovirus, that hand washing is really important, and because it's oral fecal transmitted, there's also some dispersal. Um, you know, being very aware aware of where that's happening, where potential transmission sites are and focusing on those for cleaning and disinfection. If I were, uh, you know, a caseworker and, uh, or an investigator for norovirus outbreaks, I would be, um, I, I would be definitely up on very good hand hygiene practice. I would be very careful about using a public restroom in, in one of those places, and I'd be focusing on environmental cleaning and disinfection. Great. Um, one more final question uh, related to masks. Is double masking still uh, being recommended? And I know you touched on this before, but any, um, any specific masks that environmental health and public health workers should do use during inspections, fitted testing N95s, surgical masks, or cloth masks? Great question. Um, so so the, there were recommendations from CDC to double mask it. And part of that is a lot of the commercially available either paper surgical masks or the ones you know, that you buy the cloth masks are not really fit tested very well. So the idea is you get maybe better filtration, but more importantly, better coverage of your, um, you know, of your face if, if you're wearing two masks. Um, right now, there is not a recommendation for the use of N95 respirators, which are effective at those smaller particles. We use those in healthcare settings when there is uh, a high risk of airborne transmission, where something can kind of get in the air and stay there. Um, so, um, you know, Double masking is something that's reasonable to do. It is part of the CDC's recommendations. If I if I were out doing a lot of inspections, I think that I would double mask. I'd have um, a, you know a well fitting cloth mask and then a surgical mask just because that's how it fits me um, the best. 
and you know wearing the mask and and making sure that you do some type of fit testing um you know putting it on and then just making sure that that nose is pinned down and as you breathe out right that it's not that it's not escaping when you breathe in right the mask should collapse a little it tells you all all the right things are working great awesome thank you i think we are at time, so I just wanna thank Christine, Gina, and Dr. Landers for your time today. Um, please stay tuned for additional Project First Line Environmental Health and Infection Prevention and Control resources over the next few months, and Miha will be partnering with NNPHI to provide an infection control and environmental health training, echo series, and additional resources to help fight infectious diseases for environmental health professionals. So please fill out that five question evaluation that you will be directed to at the end of the webinar or the evaluation link that is in the chat box. Finally, this Q&A session recording will be available on NEHA's website if you would like to revisit the question and the answers that were asked today. And thank you very much. Have a good rest of your day. And we actually all do mean very much thank you. Thank you for coming today and um, tuning in, but also thank you for the work that you're doing to keep our communities uh, safe. It's vitally important at this time and we appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much.